All right, you heard me say that the knowledge process that we've been discussing, the knowledge process that conditions the big barred other's jouissance, locating this jouissance in an endlessly expanding iterability where the topology of the subject swells to encompass a previous iteration of itself. I said that this knowledge process is also another way of talking about what castrates me. In other words, another way of talking about how symbolic alienation occurs for the subject. It castrates me as it brings jouissance to the big barred other, compelling me to renounce sexual jouissance, you heard me say, and always in exchange for its knockoff surplus jouissance, which Lacan again very smartly refers to as a reduction of jouissance on page 46. And you also heard me specify what I mean by this renunciation of jouissance. So this renunciative process is central to what Lacan is up to in the previous seminar, seminar 16. So you may have heard this before. My emergence as a subject it requires a renunciation of jouissance, which is not a giving up of something I once had in the past, but a willingness to forego its possession, its acquisition, its enjoyment in the future. Again, this type of renunciation of sexual jouissance that allows for surplus jouissance, it's about the hereafter, what you do from now on, not about the heretofore. In other words, not about something you had in the past, whatever has been going on up to this point. What's been going on up to the point of castration is not sexual jouissance. Sexual jouissance is an ever distant horizon where you and I are both forbidden to go. And in the meantime, we can enjoy surplus jouissance. I can't emphasize this enough. Categorically, the renunciation of sexual jouissance that conditions me as a subject is not a giving up of something I once had, but instead a willingness to forego its acquisition in the future. And this is a really important conceptual point to make because it cues up a lot of the confusion that people often have around the symbolic and the real. As though it was all real and then the symbolic stumbled into your life and required you to give up the real. Or as if the real were somehow an out of bounds beyond the limits of the symbolic. No, neither of those is accurate to Lacan's thought. The real is an effect of the symbolic. It's what we call anything that the symbolic can't metabolize, can't comprehend, can't understand. Trauma is real because it exceeds our ability to make sense of it in the moment, which is why it winds up always not just repressed, but also returning symptomatically. That's where we locate trauma, not in some real life event. Trauma is always late to its scene. It's always a missed encounter, as Lacan puts it with regard to the real. Missed because in the time of its experience, we were so overwhelmed that we didn't experience it. It's only at a later date, in the symptomatic expression, the return of the repressed, that we actually gain access to it. This is a basic tenet of psychoanalytic theory and technique. You've heard me talk about it before, but it's also what's at stake here in understanding sexual jouissance. It's not something we once had and then gave up to enter the symbolic. No. Sexual jouissance is a blip in the symbolic. It's not something we once had, but something we might strive for. We can be on the path to sexual jouissance, Lacan says. Castration says, halt, thou shalt go no further. You shall not pass. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. That is renunciation of jouissance. You shall pass no further. The second thing that you have to remember about the real is that it's not outside the symbolic. It's a hole, a furrow, a hollow, a lack, a deficit, an error, an errancy in the symbolic. 
So the real is whatever the symbolic can't metabolize. And what it can't metabolize is not something that it ejects from itself. On the contrary, it holds it within it like a hole in a donut or like a piece of gum that you swallow and that remains in your gut cannot be metabolized. Eventually, it would probably be externalized, but don't tell the eight-year-olds because they're still pretty convinced that if you swallow gum, it stays in your stomach forever. What a terrible, terrible, hilarious thing. My emergence as a subject, again, requires a renunciation of jouissance. And this is not a giving up of something I once had, but a promise that I'll not pursue it in the future. It's about the now and hereafter, not the heretofore. This, if you've got eyes to see, is why Lacan says that we don't ever transgress on page 19. This riff against transgression is really clever. It's easy to put it alongside Seminar 7 and the understanding of jouissance as something that is accessed by way of transgression. You break the rules and experience enjoyment. That doesn't last. The same way you heard me say Das Ding quickly gives way to Obje A and for good reason. And people who still bander about the Das Ding thing is just ridiculous to me. There's a reason Lacan left it in the dust, and we ought to as well, even and especially the more Kantian we are. And I'm more Kantian than I am Hegelian. Let's just be clear about that. Poor Fichte and Schelling. They don't get much traction in between. Those dudes are wizards too. Don't just read Hegel, and don't just fuck around with Kant. Read the entire idealist tradition. Some of the best people that you study and that you learn from and whose books you read they didn't just study one or the other. They read the entire German idealist tradition, the culmination of which is the Frankfurt tradition. Guaranteed they also read that. And then there's that turning point in Marx. You want the rest of your life's reading list? It's right there. Oh, wait, we forgot about Lacan. The point about renunciation is closely connected to that of transgression. The reason why I say this is the following. The renunciation of sexual jouissance is not a transgression of the symbolic. On the contrary, it is instead the fundamental constitutive acceptance of the symbolic. Renunciating sexual jouissance, promising to stop on that path and go no further, that is acceptance of the symbolic. It's the beya'um for those of you who paid attention to Lacan's seminar three on the psychoses of the name of the Father as the no of the Father. It's this acceptance, primitive, primal acceptance of prohibition that you've heard me talk about so often in earlier series in lectures on Lacan. It's that classic prohibitive understanding of the unary trait as no, thou shalt not. And it's that prohibition, that original constitutive prohibition when Lacan understands the unary trait in the 50s as a constitutive no. When you accept that no, welcome to the symbolic. Welcome to castration. Welcome to symbolic alienation. That is not a transgression. That is the opposite of a transgression. It is a fundamental acceptance of your subjugation to and subjectivization within the symbolic. That's why Lacan, at the start of Seminar 17, says, we don't ever transgress. This is not about transgression. The renunciation of sexual jouissance, now and forever, that provides us with access to surplus jouissance as a denigrated, reductive, in essence, really shitty version of sexual jouissance. This renunciation marks our acceptance of the basic prohibition that puts us in the symbolic. The basic thou shalt not. Don't forget, the name of the Father has two moments. Like so many things that we discuss in this series. The first is prohibitive. It is a no before it is a name. That's why when we were talking about S1, I made a big fuss about its two-part function as a unary trait. When your name is given to you from your family, it serves two functions. First, 
unary trait one, which is prohibitive. Second, unary trait two, if you will, which is positional. The first marks the no of the father, culminating in a superego, you heard me say. And the second marks the name of the father, culminating in an ego ideal. The first hollows us out and the second fills us in. This is how S1 as unary trait operates. It has these two moments, these two subjectivizing, subjugating moments, arguably moments in the same set. It's a structural dynamic that we're working out here. We don't ever transgress because at the level of the unary trait, which is what he's talking about here, at the level of the unary trait, we see an acceptance of the symbolic and an ensuing integration therein. Let me quote Lacan again and give you some passages to work with here. There is no transgression here, he says on page 20, but rather an eruption and the French is very accurate there, it's eruption, a falling into the field of something not unlike jouissance, a surplus. Now, the French here may have been rendered differently as the falling into the field of something in the order of jouissance. So surplus jouissance in its relationship to sexual jouissance, that's one of the things that we're going to work on. At this point, Lacan is saying it's not unlike jouissance, and yet it's still different. It's in the order of jouissance, but it is still distinct. Let's check out some more pages. Let's try and figure this out. Page 50. We'll jump around a little bit because these passages are just too good. Remember, there is no transgression here. What we see instead is an eruption a falling into the field of something that we might refer to as surplus jouissance. That's what happens when you accept castration. And by accept castration, what I mean is you renounce sexual jouissance now and forever. Let's hear how Lacan works with this. Page 50, third full paragraph. We are not dealing with a transgression. An eruption into some forbidden field through the wearing away of vital regulatory apparatuses. You can see why I want to transition to page 50 because it sounds very much like the quote we just got on page 20 about an eruption of falling into a field. Lacan's clear again. We are not dealing with a transgression here. In fact, it is only through this effect of entropy, through this wasting, that's a terrific way to understand entropy. I prefer disorder, randomness, and uncertainty because I'm, you know, I like the more thermodynamic understanding of it. But what he's doing here is great around wasting because it puts him on the path to that reject. Hang tight. We'll talk about it in a minute. In fact, it's only through this effect of entropy, through this wasting, that jouissance acquires a status and shows itself. That's why I initially introduced it by the term Merlust in the German here, surplus jouissance. It is precisely through being perceived in the dimension of loss, this is going to be key for us, something necessitates compensation. Very important here. If I can put it like this, for what is initially a negative number, that's a great way to think about the unary trait. It's a negative one. I like the negative one because the negative part captures the un in English and un in German, but also captures with the number one, the one-ness that we get in the French un. It's in this negative number that this something that has come and struck resonated on the walls of the bell Bell, now if you've seen our series on Seminar 16, you know there's a bell in Seminar 16, the grelot, the sleigh bell. And you saw what we did with that sleigh bell. It was so much fun. I so love talking about sleigh bells. I gave a few other lectures around San Francisco at that time, and the sleigh bell came up, and people were just like, 
what the f- is the what? Did you just say sleigh bell sign? Yeah, I'll talk about sleigh bells. I don't know what kind of bell he's talking about here. It doesn't seem to be a direct reference to the grello, the sleigh bell in seminar 16. But man, anytime this guy talks about bells, I can't help but think of that middle chapter. Maybe it's chapter 15, I forget. In seminar 16, where the grello comes up. And you'll recall what we did with that bell. The traditional image that we get of object little a, that we get from the symposium where Socrates is a crusty old box, but there's something shiny inside him, an agalma, a little fucking treasure inside him. Man, forget about that. Lacan sure as hell has. By the time we get to the late 1960s, the image of Obje A is not that of a shitty exterior with something shiny inside. Nah, man. It's at the level of the sleigh bell, the little round bells that jingle in a shimmery fashion that are oftentimes shiny on the exterior, shiny enough to reflect your own image in it. What is inside the grillo? What is the little piece of shit inside that rattles around? A bean? A rock? A piece of scrap metal that rattles around inside the bell, working through the interspatial relation between the piece of shit inside and the shiny exterior that sounds off when it hits it. Those three entities, the shiny exterior, the piece of shit interior, and the interspatial relation between them, all are obje a when you get to seminar 16. And all are well illustrated in how a grillo works. From the shiny exterior in which we threaten to lose ourselves in a specular image, to the shitty interior that tells us what puts the object in object A, the reject in obje a and then to that differential relation between shitty interior and shiny exterior that we traditionally in this series mark as obje a the differential relation between two entities. It's all there in the bell. It's interesting too, if you want me to just go off on bells a little bit here, most of the terminology for a bell is anatomical. Bells have shoulders, crowns, tongues, mouths, lips, You understand the drive? Check out the bell. Consider how bells operate. Anyway, blast from the past, seminar 16. Here he is again talking about bells. I can't help but have that part of our past pop up in this present as a repetition. Hold on to this because I'm not just riffing on bells. I'm illustrating a concept we're going to come to here, namely the retrospective, retroactive, retro-efficacy that Lacan understands by repetition. Reading this sentence again, it's precisely through being perceived in the dimension of loss. Something necessitates compensation, if I can put it like this, for what is initially a negative number, that this something that has come and struck, resonated on the walls of the bell, has created jouissance. Jouissance that is to be repeated. Only the dimension of entropy gives body to the fact that there is surplus jouissance there to be recovered. And then Lacan is into the unary trait, and then he's into talking about all these stoppers, these objects, metonymic, that come in to replace lost objects in classical psychoanalytic understandings of the drive, which are not the understandings of the drive that we've been working with. If you follow this series from the drive forward, it's not about objects lost and metonymic. It's about openings, found and enjoyed. Hold off on that for a second. 50 is a great page to give you a paragraph to think about around loss. What is the nature of loss that conditions surplus jouissance is one question. Reading on. And by on, I mean back. Once more, let's look back. One more time. Page 46. It's got another great passage here about return, loss, jouissance. You'll see where we're going. Hang tight. Get your book. Let's do some reading. As everything in the facts and clinical experience indicates to us, 
I read on page 46 of seminar 17. Repetition is based on the return of jouissance. That's one way to think about this. Surplus jouissance is a return in fragmented partial form of sexual jouissance, which doesn't mean we had it and then lost it. Hear me now. And what in this connection is well spelled out by Freud himself is that in this very repetition, something is produced that is a defect, a failure. It's going to be objea. What is this loss, this defect, this failure that is produced by the return of jouissance in the function of repetition? That's one way to ask the question here. Now, this is also what Lacan is doing with entropy, as we will see. At the time here, I pointed out the kinship with remarks by Kierkegaard. Oh, Lord. We got some Danish Lacanians in this series, so I can't help but get a little Kierkegaard popping. Don't let me. I'm not going to go there. I've written too much on Kierkegaard. Too much. I'm trying to be done with Kierkegaard. Don't tell the Danes, though, because I love going there and hanging out and talking with them about this. Absolutely. Lacan cues up Kierkegaard, not surprisingly, because Kierkegaard has a book on repetition, which is a great book on repetition. It's one of the classic books on repetition. By virtue of being expressed and as such repeated, of being marked by repetition, what is repeated cannot be anything other in relation to what it repeats than a loss. Say what? This is where things get kinky for Lacan. A loss of whatever you like. A loss of momentum. There is something that is a loss. Right from the outset, right from the elaboration that I am summarizing here, Freud insists on this loss. In repetition itself, there is a reduction in jouissance. So repetition condi conditions a kind of loss. And there are some ways to understand this that are clear and crisp. But this is the passage, these are the passages that we're working with here. This is where the function of the lost object originates in Freudian discourse. And there is really no need to remind you that it is explicitly around masochism, conceived only in the dimension of the search for this ruinous jouissance that Freud's entire text revolves. This stuff about the return of jouissance in repetition where a defect or a failure or a loss is sustained is absolutely central to understanding what Lacan is doing with repetition at the end of the 1960s. And you've heard me say it before, it's the core concept of his work, I believe, in the late 1960s and here in the early 70s. He's going to be keeping with this for a minute. Let me read this one sentence to you, Gillen. By virtue of being expressed and as such repeated, of being marked by repetition, what is repeated cannot be anything other in relation to what it repeats than a loss. So, an event that is repeated from the vantage point of its repetition is designated as a loss. If only for the very basic sense that it is past, it is no longer, it is lost relative to a future moment that represents it, that repeats it, that indexes it, that cues it back up. Choose your word here. The repetition retroactively indexes and cues up that which it repeats. And it cues it up as a loss. That's the important part here. Entropy flows backwards in time for Lacan. Don't tell the physicist down the hall. We'll come to that again here in a moment. Another great passage there though, page 50, page 46, this is something that we have to be sticking with here. Surplus jouissance, if we could try and sum this up, is a retrograde, oh, I hesitate to use that word, but instantiation of sexual jouissance at a certain remove. And its effect, the effect of surplus jouissance is retroactive. Sexual jouissance is designated and always as lost by surplus jouissance. And things are going to get pretty interesting and weird around this, because you just heard me say that we did not have sexual jouissance before surplus jouissance came along. 
No, it's because we have renounced and given up the pursuit of sexual jouissance that we get surplus jouissance in exchange. And yet here I am telling you that entropy flows backwards in time for Lacan, that the loss indexed by repetition is a loss in the past where something is no longer. How are we to make sense of these apparently contradictory understandings? Let's see what we can make of it. I, as you can tell, really want to drive home this point about repetition, retroefficacy, and loss. Repetition for Lacan, you've heard me say, equals retroaction. The repeated entity or event indexes its predecessor. It calls it out anew. And let me be clear. It calls it out as an origin. It's only when an entity or an event is repeated that it retroactively can become the origin, in this case of a sequence, in this case of a repetition. Relative to the moment or act of its repetition, this original event is past. It is gone. It is lost. That's the simplest way to understand what Lacan is here doing. When you repeat something, the something that you repeat is lost. Lost because it's not technically present in the repetition, and yet it's only by way of the repetition that we gain access to some of these entities. Think about the relationship between trauma and symptom, primal scene and symptomatic expression. Think about the relationship between repression and its return. We've talked a lot about this, so I won't spend too much time on it, but I want to cue them up as examples. Examples of a very peculiar diagram that you see running throughout Lacan's thought, where you have a diachronic arrow of time or language or speech unfolding in a chronological fashion, and then you have this retroactive, typically an arrow of meaning, that cuts across it. Look at the opening elementary graphs in his subversion of the subject essay, and you'll see the structure I'm talking about, where you have these two time flows through Lacan. One in which speech unfolds in a moment, one right after the other, metonymically you've heard Lacan often say, and another in which meaning occurs at the end of the sentence, looping back through and telling you everything you need to know about what occurred before, where meaning is synchronic, where meaning is retroactive, where meaning works by metaphor. You've heard all this a million times. I'm not going to spend too much time with it. We started with seminar 10 when the going got good, and we're sticking with the later Lacan. But it's present in his earlier work also is what I'm telling you here. Again, clear, coherent, and accessible is our mantra. So let's try it. Let's see how clear and coherent we can be about this stuff. This event that is repeated, I want to emphasize a couple of things. It's different from itself. The entity or event before its repetition is not the same as the entity or event during and after its repetition. It went from being a singularity out in the world doing whatever the fuck it did to becoming an original, an origin, a one in the sequence leading to two. You might even prefer that it's the zero point. If you get what Lacan is doing with loss, you'll see that the better numerical designation for this entity is a zero. And if you want to push it even further, it ain't a one and it ain't a zero, baby. It's a negative one. But for now, we don't need to trip about all that. What we're just trying to figure out is this cross-temporal relationship between an entity or an event and its repetition, always necessarily at a later date. My point is that what this thing was before it was repeated ain't what it is during and after its repetition. And it's certainly not the repetition itself. The Mona Lisa hanging on the wall is not the Mona Lisa that you see on my t-shirt. Here again is a point to hold in mind about how Lacan thinks. Yes, he is keen on repetition and difference. You see it in his understanding of language. 
Language is a differential system of signifiers whose meaning is sustained through iterative, repetitive uses of the same signifiers in different circumstances. What you see in Lacan, though, if you want to be very precise about what he's doing with difference and repetition, holler, Deleuzians, Lacan is looking at repetition structurally, logically. It's structural repetition that interests him. And that's what you see in the logic that is the big barred other. It's a structural repetition of the topology of the subject. That's why I draw it with one S2 encompassing another. It's an iterative structural logic. When it comes to difference, the easiest way to understand what Lacan is doing with difference is not so much spatially, but temporally. Temporal difference is what interests him. And you can see how these two would come together in his turn towards topology, because there you see a space time of difference that can be worked out. It's really terrific stuff what he does with topology because it capitalizes on his very profound thinking of temporal difference. A lot of this pops up in the previous seminar, Seminar 16, and Lacan kind of assumes that folks already have it under their belts. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I'm here to help with that. My point is that the lost object in question here from the passages we were just reading from Seminar 17 and this commentary, the lost object is always a lost object origin, designated by its substitution, repetition, in other different objects. An object, entity or event, a repetition, that essentially marks itself as second rank, if you prefer, maybe even second rate. So, take a metonymic object, the cigarette. The cigarette, you can very simplistically, and even at the risk of really getting this wrong, understand the cigarette as a metonymic repetition. A metonym because it kind of like changes the name, if you follow the Greek here, and flits from one to one to one. Neither of these is whole. These are all parts to parts to parts, the way metonymy works as a trope. The cigarette is a metonymic stand-in for, I don't know, man, the breast. The classic lost object of orality, the breast. The cigarette becomes the metonymic object that stands in for the breast that stopped returning a long time ago. The quote-unquote lost object. How about my birthday? My birthday is a repetition of my birth. Annual repetition of my birth. It always repeats an earlier event and marks that event as the origin of this motherfucking birthday party. The origin that this birthday party repeats is the one in which I slithered out between piss and shit back in the late 19. Anyway. Now, Again, you've got that example, sexual jouissance and surplus jouissance. The way I want to figure it, though, to maintain Lacan's thought here, sexual jouissance is not an earlier moment. It is an objective, a horizon that we have renunciated, that we have let go of. And surplus jouissance is a realization, an accomplishment, a way of being that we get to have in exchange. Let's see if we can turn the screw a few more times. The original and its rape production, its repetition, they both suffer entropy. The latter in the very technical, traditional sense of entropy. The former, though, in a way that's quite different. The former, the original, suffers entropy because it's now tinged with loss, if only because designated as no longer. My birthday is always overshadowed by an event that is no longer, namely my birth. Same with yours. It's lost to the past. And that's a kind of entropic trajectory from the birthday to the birth that is lost, designated as no longer in the event of the birthday. Now, why does the reproduction of the original also suffer entropy because it's only ever an attenuated variant 
a knockoff of the original, and one which relies on the original for its identity. Now, you can read Shakespeare and get some of this. Read Henry IV, the sun and the moon. The moon is bright because it reflects light from other entities, including the earth. The dark side of the moon, baby, is almost certainly what happens when light hits the earth and bounces back to the part of the moon that is not reflecting the sun. But the moon is brilliant and bright because it borrows light, the same way Henry does from Richard. If you prefer your Shakespeare. We don't try and fuck with that stuff in here. Unfortunately, clear, coherent, and accessible Lacan prohibits us from working through Elizabethan texts. <laughs> and instead, talking about the big other trying to take a shit and cram it back up himself. I received a few emails about that one. I'm glad you all like it. Did you ever read Walter Benjamin? I used to read Benjamin a lot. If you've read my earlier work, Benjamin was all over my thought. I still think he's a damn wizard. I love Walter Benjamin. Think about what he does with the aura. The aura for Benjamin is something that belongs to the original, in the original's context, in the tradition, in the rituals that prop up its originality. The original is the original Mona Lisa. There can only be one. It's about uniqueness and the like. And then he asks the question of what happens when you start putting Mona Lisa on a t-shirt? Well, you start putting Mona Lisa on t-shirts and sweating her and you've got suddenly Mona Lisa on a calendar, Mona Lisa on a poster, on a ceiling above a bed in a college room, a college dorm room, and suddenly what you have is a degeneration, a distribution, a loss of aura. This is traditionally how we read Benjamin's work on mechanical reproduction. I don't think that that's the best way to read his work. I think that's untrue to Benjamin's own thought, even if that's more or less what he says in that essay. Benjamin's thought is quite a bit more sophisticated and more in line with what Lacan is doing with repetition as retro-efficacy. The aura of the original work of art, what I would suggest is this. Even if this marks a correction of Benjamin, I don't really care. The origin only appears in and through its decline in moments of reproduction. It's when the reproductions start to occur, whether it's a printing a film, a photograph of an event. It's when the reproductions start to occur that we actually can see the aura of the original work of art. But it always appears to us as something that is in decline, as something that is running out of steam. The same way that you identify a comet in the night sky, to stay astrological here, not by looking at the comet itself that is sizzling through the sky. Nah, man, you identify the comet by the trace it leaves behind it. That is what we see in the relationship between erratic art and mass reproduction. Mass reproduction marks the beginning of an erratic work of art's decline, the decline of its aura. But from the original work of art to the mass reproduction, you see a tracer, and it's by way of that trace of decline that you can start to see the aura. You see the aura, in other words, only after it no longer exists without reproduction. Benjamin on the aura could be more sophisticated with Lacan. The aura of the original, again, it only appears in and through its decline in moments of mass reproduction. Isn't this why the repressed is indistinguishable from its return? Dear Lacanians, the original, let me be categorical, is at once established and effaced by its repetition. The original, whatever entity event we're talking about here, is at once established and effaced by its repetition at a later date, by its reproduction, mass and otherwise. This is a kind of entropy. It's only in the original's decline, diminishment, and dissipation 
that occurs in rep reproductions of itself, repetitions, when its uniqueness and original context can be seen, but only ever seen as lost, as losing, as fading out. This is where you see the aura. You see the aura as a losing out, a fading out, a gradually faded trace. Consider, for instance, that painting that we consider all so often when Lacanians get together, the ambassadors. You heard Lacan pop about this in Seminar 11. You may have heard him pop about it elsewhere. The aura of this painting, the ambassadors, as an actual painting somewhere in the world, it appears clearest to readers of Lacan because this painting is a repeated touch point in his work. The reason why the ambassadors as a painting has an aura for Lacanians is precisely because we've heard so much about it, repeated instances of its discussion in and beyond Lacan's work. If you ain't read Lacan and you walk through that museum and you see the original ambassador's painting by Holbein, you're like, okay, two weird fucking bearded dudes. And maybe you notice the smear skull at the bottom and you're like, oh, okay, that, I mean, that's cool. Okay, cool, cool. Very interesting. You might even remember it. Lacanians, though, they'll travel halfway around the world to see that original. The aura that that original has for Lacanians, hear me now, is not endemic to the work of art itself. It's because Lacan repeatedly refers to it in his work. In other words, at the level of its mass reproduction, its repetition, that is when the original takes on its status as original. It's because we've read about this painting in Lacan that it becomes a work of art worthy of our pursuit. Which brings us to entropy. You knew I wanted to talk about it. You know I'm gonna talk about entropy. I can't resist. Entropy in physics, thermodynamics, information theory, Lacan would have done better if he had let go of thermodynamics, which he clearly references here in 17, and instead stuck with information theory, in my humble opinion. But he's thinking with, thinking with thermodynamics, that's great. Entropy is an increase in disorder, randomness, uncertainty, as a system develops over time. As a system develops over time, it starts to come unraveled. That's entropy in the classic thermodynamic sense. You heard me earlier refer to the human body. As the body ages, things start to break down. That breakdown is called entropy. Your teeth start to fall out. I don't fucking know what it is. How about when you mix ingredients? Let's say you've got coffee and milk. That's my jam every morning, coffee and milk. When you have the milk next to the coffee, you've got low entropy because there's not a lot of confusion between them. But as soon as you mix your milk into the coffee, that is a high entropic state. There's high entropy at that point because the mixing of ingredients causes them to become dispersed amongst and amidst themselves. This is entropy. Melting ice. Entropic system. Why? Because you went from having a single solid, put an ice cube on the counter, you can pretty readily separate the counter from the ice cube. But wait till that shit melts. Water goes everywhere. It disperses. It goes in all these different directions. That is entropy. How about the spreading of your scent? Maybe not yours, maybe your dog, maybe the way an animal would spread a scent. How about the way incense burns in a room? You have a stick of incense and then you light it and that previously discreet stick of incense turns into smoke. Don't forget, Benjamin's muse was Baudelaire and Baudelaire's muse was always a stick of incense. That or hair. Baudelaire's good and nasty, just like that. If you're going to read Benjamin, as I encourage you to do, don't forget to cue up Baudelaire as well. Start with Paris Spleen. How about the parable of the sower? For all you bibliophiles out there, I get emails from y'all wanting me to tell more about Semitic history, about early Christianity and the like, and about why monks have strange haircuts. <laughs> Absolutely. This ain't that scene, but here it works. 
The parable of the sower is a parable about entropy. You go from having a handful of contained seeds to seeds cast into the wind, some of which fall on rocky soil and dry out, some of which fall on sand and get washed away, some are eaten by birds, some fall on fertile soil, some who fucking knows. That's the point about entropy. Who fucking knows where this shit goes? That's entropy. Now, you'll notice the difference here between the disseminatory and tropic system that we get from Jesus at the level of the parable of the sower and the hyper-focused, low-entropic system we get from his parallel, Socrates. The metaphors of farming we get in Plato, referring back to Socrates, are typically of the dialectician, the philosopher taking a single seed and finding a perfect place in a willing subject to plant that seed. One seed, one soil, no waste, no entropy. These are the pillars of Western morality. You can rock with Jesus or you can rock with Socrates, but it comes down to what they do with seeds in terms of how you want to be in the world. Unfortunately, in the psychoanalytic and psychotherapeutic traditions, dialogue and Socrates became the model. If you read Lacan carefully, though, it's very clear, even despite what Lacan says, you've heard me indicate, that Jesus and dissemination should in fact be the model. Now, if this is all news to you, check out my man, John Durham Peters, 1999 classic, Speaking Into the Air. How about wear and tear? Wear and tear as an expression is about entropy. Lease agreements. You can't get charged at the end of your tenancy for, ra- for wear and tear at the level of, I don't know, the floors. How about actuarial science? Your car is worth less because it has wear and tear, presumably determinable by the age of the vehicle relative to the present. Car resales are all about wear and tear. Here's my point about all this talk of entropy because I want it to be clear to you. All of these entropic examples, from thermodynamics to coffee making, they presuppose a certain chronology where there's lower entropy to start and higher entropy over time in a given system. So ice starts with low entropy. There's not a lot of disorder, randomness, and uncertainty at the level of an ice cube on the counter. Over time, though, entropy starts to occur. It starts to unfold. This chronological understanding of entropy is exactly the opposite of how Lacan thinks entropy. In Seminar 17, entropy is retroactive. Loss is at the point of origin, conditioned, occasioned, indexed, my friends, and measured by a later event. Entropy for Lacan is at the origin, at the level of the ice cube, not at the level of its melting. This is why it's tough to wrap your head around what Lacan is doing with entropy. Because if you look up entropy and you try and figure out in physics, thermodynamics, information theory, where the fuck you go with entropy, it usually has this chronos in the Greek sense of one moment after the other. This is what Lacan means by diachrony, by the way, sticking with that example from the 50s Lacan. A chronological understanding where one thing leads to another. A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. Or if you like your Fibonacci sequence, you know, you've got your three, your five, your eight, and the like. These sequential understandings of entropy presume that there's low entropy at the start, high entropy at the second, third, fourth, further out moments. Lacan says, nah, baby, it's the opposite. When he says repetition is retroactive and signals a moment of loss, the loss is at the origin that is designated by the repetition. It's at the birth, not the birthday, that we see entropy taking over for Lacan. It's there that we see loss. It's there that we see disorder, randomness, and uncertainty. It's at the trauma, not the symptom, that we see an entropic spin-out.